So first and foremost, welcome and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Jeff Beck. I'm the Director of Admission here at Trinity Pauling. We are thrilled to have you with us uh, to discuss tradition and innovation uh, and specific to how that relates to us here at Trinity Pauling. Uh, we have some wonderful educators uh, this evening on the webinar uh, that have joined us and, and taken some time. Uh, I would like to first and foremost introduce them and then we will be able to jump into our evening here. So first and foremost, uh, with our winter background is Rob Fideli, uh, class of 2004. He's an English teacher, dorm parent, advisor, varsity football, wrestling, and baseball coach here at Trinity Pauling. Next, we have Josh Frost, uh, reminding us that spring does come after winter. Uh, we have, uh, he's the class of 2004, a modern languages uh, teacher, dorm parent advisor and the head of our varsity farming program, which we'll hear more about today, which is quite fun. Uh, we have Gabe Avis, art teacher, dorm parent advisor, uh, and also works with our mountain biking, mountain biking, squash, and lacrosse programs. We have Mr. Scott Harf, our director of college counseling, an economics teacher, also coaches varsity hockey and JV lacrosse. We have Roberta Lidl, our dean of teaching and learning, uh, Roberta started working at Trinity Pauling uh, in 2002 and is a wealth of knowledge for our students. And then lastly, we have Headmaster Bill Taylor, who assumed the role in 2015, uh, but previously had spent 14 years at Trinity Pauling uh, before uh, taking a brief stint away and then joining us again here to take over the role as Headmaster. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, and we'll jump kind of right into our program. The topic for this evening is, is the coming together of tradition and innovation at Trinity Pauling. Often these terms can be seen as an opposition to one another. Uh, if something is traditional, then it can't be viewed as being innovative or vice versa. If something is innovative, it's clearly replaced something that is more traditional. Here at Trinity Pauling, these, these terms work together in a more symbiotic way. That, and that is what we want to explore during the course of this webinar this evening. If you do have questions as we continue on, please feel free to, to put them in our Q&A function. We'll do our best to answer them here this evening. If not, you will hear from one of us tomorrow answering your question. So I'll begin by asking Headmaster Taylor what, what, what these terms really mean here at Trinity Pauling and how they can actually work together in education. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us this evening to uh, spend some time with us and learn more about what we're what we're up to here in Pauling, New York at Trinity Pauling School. Um, so tradition and innovation, it's really uh, it's 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 a very interesting and um, compelling topic for me because this was one of the charges in the search profile sheet for Trinity Pauling's uh, search for a new headmaster in 2015. And uh, specifically, the, the school was looking for someone that, uh, that could recognize that these are not mutually exclusive terms. And I think it's probably because I began my career at Trinity Pauling uh, and, and could had 13, 14 years of of really valuing the, the role that tradition plays in the life of a school and the life of a boarding school. Um, and, but also began my teaching career here and had the opportunity to be innovative. And then I had the opportunity when I left here to actually uh, work to create a new school where both of those themes, tradition and innovation uh, were held together. And uh, so in one sense, the, the opportunity to, to come back to Trinity Pauling was an exercise on how to lean more thoughtfully into how tradition and innovation can strengthen one another. And, and what I mean by that is that if we look at tradition as really those practices that, uh, that we repeat, that we value, but the practices reveal deeper meanings and intentionality uh, by those who are valuing them and by those who are, are practicing them. They, they reveal something deeper about ourselves. They reveal something deeper about an institution that values them. Um, and, and that is extremely important for the continuity of any educational institution. 
connecting uh, the past to the present to the future. Uh, and then innovation, if we look at that as the practice of adapting things when necessary to achieve a different uh, and perhaps a more desirable outcome. And uh, as if we're talking about life of schools in, in the context of continuity, then you need both. You need traditions to, uh, to uh, trace the school's history from the past to the present into the future, but you also need to be able to adapt when necessary, including adapting some of the traditions uh, to make them even more relevant uh, to the future. So for example, uh, here's one very uh, basic example. Uh, Trinity Pauling, like most boarding schools, like many independent schools, has a dress code. Uh, and uh, Trinity Pauling's dress code, most days here, the boys are wearing jacket and tie. So if you, if you were to ask the headmaster 30 years ago, 40 years ago, why, why the boys are wearing jacket and tie, uh, it would be about, it, it probably, the headmaster would say, it's about showing and valuing the respect that you have for what you're doing. Uh, and then the headmaster probably did, and I did hear headmasters say this. And besides, this is what most of you are gonna be working when you enter the workforce. Um, and so if they ask me about the importance of a dress code, I will talk about the importance of respecting what you're doing, respecting the fact that, that learning is a valuable exercise. It is a, a life changing exercise and, and that, that demands our respect. And we wear clothes that show that we are, uh, respecting the, uh, the dignity of that process. I probably don't add that this is what you're going to be wearing in the workforce because in many cases you're not wearing that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully whatever we're doing in the workplace, we're respecting what we're doing and we're respecting what we put forth. And so here at the school, we talk about that in how we prepare ourselves for each day. Chapel is a tradition here. Uh, and we're an Episcopal, Episcopal school by, by history and tradition. Uh, but we're, we're not looking at chapel. We're not trying to convert anybody into one particular way of belief. We do uh, value chapel because it's the time that the community comes together. And we're, when you're living uh, in a boarding school community, uh, you're exercising respect, you're exercising mutuality, you're exercising um, forgiveness and responsibility and accountability. And Chapel's the place where we go and we, uh, we exercise that. We were reminded about what that means as a community together. Uh, we have various different spaces around the campus that are, that are traditional spaces of high value. Um, we, have, we emphasize effort as a critical role in the learning process because of the, the tradition of that here. It goes back to our founding, the founding of Dr. Gamage that that, that valued the role that effort plays in, in finding achievement. Um, and so those, those are important traditions. Over time, some of them get tweaked, uh, as I said, with the dress code. Uh, in, we've tweaked some of the chapel to, to, to make it uh, more relevant today and so forth. Uh, but if you were to talk about the learning practice, uh, the academic practice, the discipline of teaching, if you were to look at that in a traditional context, it would have been the teacher or in the, in the parlance of, of, this, uh, of, of this environment, the master, the teacher, standing at the front of the classroom, all the students in rows looking at, at the teacher, the teacher uh, delivering content and the students absorbing that content. Traditionally, that's how education was practiced. That's how I learned. Uh, I learned by memorizing what the teachers uh, said and what they wrote down and so forth. And I could trade on that commodity. Uh, and that doesn't work very well anymore. Uh, and so 
we've added innovation into the into the learning environment because it's much better for today's learners, uh, particularly boys who learn best by doing. Um, so that you know that's sort of the role that they play together. And I I know I've I've talked a little bit about the traditions um, and a little bit of, not so much about the innovations, but uh, so. Jeff, back to you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and, and we're we're uh, fortunate this evening to have uh, two alums. And so I, I would love to pass it to, uh, to to Josh first here to comment on on maybe some of the traditions that they remember, but also in their time now as faculty members, how the, those traditions have maybe evolved a little bit into being a little bit more innovative, uh, and how they approach and, and attack their kind of the, the lifestyle that they have here at Trinity Pauling. So Josh, I'll pass that to you first, and then uh, Ralph, you can follow up after that. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, so as I, I was a day student when I was at, uh, at Trinity Pauling, and so as I was considering uh, what you've been saying, I, I several traditions that were really meaningful to me, and one of them was chapel, and it, it was more from an individual perspective because as a student and, and now as a faculty member, uh, it was a place where I could pause and, and sort of gather my thoughts and sort of connect with uh, my, you know, my sort of spiritual side and, and let the stress and everything sort of just put it on hold for 30 minutes and, and hear a, you know, a message and be with uh, my, now my colleagues and, and before obviously with my friends. And, and so that was a, a really meaningful time for me during the day uh, to just help me get through the day. So I appreciate having that time. Uh, it's still very much the same today in, in that respect. There's, there's not too much innovation that I can think of that has happened in the chapel per se, but I think that's okay. Cause that's, I mean, the, the structure of it is, is, is part of the benefit there. So um, I, 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 I really appreciate having that, uh, that continue as part of our day here. Um, I would also add that, uh, so sort of the, the effort challenge <clears throat> was that, you know, I remember as a student competing with Ralph and my other classmates to see who could outwork the other. And, uh, you know, when, when the effort marks were posted, sort of razzing each other and, and seeing who, you know, who had, but who had done better. And I, and it, it was healthy for us because it really spurred, I think it spurred us on to work as hard as we could in the classroom and on the playing field and in our clubs and everything we did. And I sort of have carried that you know, forward as I, as I entered the workforce in college, just always putting forth as much effort as I could um, for different reasons, but you know, just sort of learning at Trinity Pauling, the sort of the joy in, in, and satisfaction in knowing that you, you did uh, the best job you could. So I think that's super valuable. Um, there's a lot of other uh, traditions that I, I can think of that I really value still and, and even more now as a faculty member, but I, I don't want to take them all. I'll, I'll leave some space here for Ralph. Go ahead, Ralph. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Josh being modest, he was usually at the top of group one. Uh, <laughs> I tried my best to uh, compete with him. Um, but uh, the effort system was definitely uh, part of why my parents, when they were looking at uh, prep school, love Trinity Pauling. Uh, they just saw it as that added value in terms of, um, you, you know, you have your achievement grades, but are you putting forth uh, your best effort in achieving, you know, to your highest potential? Um, and you get to see uh, the work that you put in, not just in your academics, but on dorm or on the athletics field. And you see kind of how um, your teachers valued your work and where they felt you, know, you could improve or um, how well you were doing in terms of your effort. Um, and I think that still rings true today um, in terms of the, the effort challenge. Um, Chapel was also uh, a great place for, for meeting. Um, we do, on Monday is a little different with we go to the theater and, and we get to hear about um, all the athletic contests that happen over the weekend and um, some of the artwork that's uh, been accomplished over the week. So I think that's probably where it's changed a little bit. 
um, and, and really awesome to see kind of all the work that's being done over the week. Um, some, some of the leadership type positions within the, the student body has remained similar in terms of proctors and prefects. Uh, and, and that's awesome to see. I, I live in a freshman dorm and um, the process of, of seeing the freshmen kind of cling to their proctors and, and needing their assistance. And then, you know, they go off to other dorms and then hopefully some of them come back as seniors and, and uh, kind of pay it forward to the new incoming freshmen. So those traditions are awesome to, to see continue uh, as a faculty member. Now, Ralph, when you and Josh were here, uh, we had uh, sit down family style dinners. Uh, and about four years ago, we shifted that to lunches. Uh, and that's, I wouldn't say that's being innovative, but that is an example of tweaking a tradition to get more value out of it because uh, it was done at dinners and that, that was a big part of the school's past. Um, and after sports, everybody would go back and change their, put their ties back on, go back to dinner. Uh, but one of the things that that tradition left out were the day students. So, uh, Josh, you mentioned you were a day student. You may have stayed for dinner uh, several times, but, uh, but not every day student would. And in shifting that practice from sit-down family-style dinners to lunch, we kept the importance of the community coming together, the opportunity that it, get, that it gives for uh, younger boys to get to know older boys, for all boys getting to know, know different faculty members, um, faculty members get to know different students and so forth, and to have a conversation while you're eating. Uh, and, but we shifted it to lunch where more people could benefit from that. Um, and Gabe, you started, you know, last year. So, you know, you're, you know, you're in, in the midst or you're, this is the first year that we've sort of been back to, to doing this. What's your experience on some of these traditions as a, as a newer faculty member? Yeah, I have kind of a unique entrance into training Pauline where obviously I, my first year was during the height of COVID-19 and the, in the pandemic. So a lot of the traditions that we had, um, were paused. So my first time actually entering the chapel, having lived on campus, having worked in my classroom all last year, first time I ever stepped foot in the chapel was this past fall. So, you know, hearing faculty last year saying, oh, just wait until we have candlelight service, which is our um, right before uh, we depart for winter uh, break, we have a, a beautiful uh, service in the chapel and hearing things like sit down lunches and um, hearing things like senior coffee, you know, as a new faculty member, it was kind of like, oh man, I, I hope some of these traditions continue and I hope some of them uh, stay. And then there are some traditions where I was like, you know what, I wouldn't mind if we, uh, if we tweak them a little bit. I'm, you know, uh, Headmaster Taylor was just talking about the dress code. And I think it's great that on uh, some days, uh, uh, the boys can dress down uh, a little bit. Uh, I think that's, that, that's great. And a tradition that we kept from last year during the, during the pandemic, we've kept some of it going into, into this year. So it's really fun to, to start to see some of these traditions almost have a rebirth after the pandemic. Um, you know, Trini Pauline uh, has definitely uh, had a very successful year last year uh, in, in the, during, the, during the pandemic. And I think taking that momentum from last year into this year, especially tweaking some of the traditions that we already have is just, uh, has just been really exciting as a new faculty member to, uh, to see and um, be a part of. You know, I know we want to transition um, into some more of the innovative aspects, but but again, I want to come back to sort of the working definition of tradition, those things that we practice that reveal something that the community values uh, and and gives the, the school an opportunity to be intentional about providing time for those traditions. So in everything that we just talked about, those values are respect, community, uh, brotherhood. Uh, we have traditions that respect the gifts and talents of each individual. Uh, the idea that, uh, that 
that this is a process of becoming, of being a student here at Trinity Pauling. So all of these traditions reinforce those key, uh, key tenets of the Trinity Pauling experience. Well, absolutely, and thank you all. I also want to add that when we when we talk about innovation, as we will hear more about, right, uh, as we move forward here, uh, a lot of that innovation is is designed and, and student centered. Uh, so keep that in mind as you hear as our as our you know panelists here talk. Just understand that a lot of what we're doing from the class day to what the students are wearing is, is it has the students in mind. So that innovation that is in some ways colliding with tradition is also because it's what might be best for our students and that student centered. But Headmaster Taylor, we have a question and this couldn't have been a better question, I think, uh, that was submitted earlier about the academic disciplines and how they lend themselves to greater innovation as the world becomes more diverse. We also had another question, which, <clears throat> which kind of dovetails to that about the latest information on how boys learn best. As you begin to speak about innovation and as we start to cover that innovation, uh, how do you kind of work these two, how can you answer these two questions or work these two questions into one? Sure. Uh, well, the world's becoming more diverse because it's becoming smaller. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the focus on a global community has become larger. And, uh, and for that reason, among others, it's, it's a far more diverse world that our students are entering than uh, than the world that I entered in or my colleagues entered after, uh, after college. Um, and so certainly uh, there are some disciplines that, that lend themselves uh, to, be, to being more amenable to innovation. Uh, certainly uh, technology skills, uh, there's need for, you know, always a greater need for coding. Those skills are important in that discipline. Uh, but also uh, skills in, in academic disciplines that, that broaden uh, cultural awareness for, for students. Uh, but beyond uh, being focused on disciplines, you know, we're, we're really focused about what I mentioned, the skills, the skills that, that students are learning in all of their disciplines. Uh, and the synthesis of those disciplines that are that are necessary to bring greater meaning uh, to the world around around us and around the students. Um, and so the innovations that we've put in place uh, in recent years have to do with opportunities in the curriculum to synthesize material from different academic disciplines that add creativity, that add critical thinking, that add collaboration, that add communication uh, skills in both writing and, and verbal communication. These are critical skills, and I would throw citizenship into that, into that mix as well. But these are critical skills that lend themselves to innovation that will prepare students for uh, this 21st century world that we're in. These are the commodities that are that are more highly valued today than they were even 50 years ago. And so the innovations that we've put into place are to create avenues, create time, create structures around opportunities for students to learn academic material, to synthesize academic materials in ways that that uh, are more emphatic in their emphasis, their their focus on uh, critical thinking, communication, creativity, collaboration, and citizenship. So the practicum for uh, leadership that we have uh, that has three different components to it and is a graduation requirement, uh, literally will walk students through a journey of these different, these different skills, culminating in a senior independent project that is uh, multifaceted. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a moment. Uh, some of the new innovations this year are institutes for active learning are doing the same thing, but they're, do, they're creating ways to explore those creative skills, those critical thinking skills, collaborative skills, and so forth in ways that are much more experiential, that are, that are looking at the classroom in a, in a far different way. And we've created time to do all this it's not replacing more traditional 
uh, academic time, we're doing that too. We're just doing both and. We're, we're following a, uh, a college preparatory curriculum, but we're also creating other opportunities to where that curriculum can, uh, can extend into areas that are more innovative. Um, and, and those are important for, uh, for all students, I would say, but they're particularly important for boys. Uh, and this, this is to the second question about uh, the research into boys uh, learning and how boys learn best. About a month ago, there was a article in the Wall Street Journal, and I've referenced this in a previous uh, uh, webinar. So if you were on that, I apologize for my redundancy, but it talks about the, the gap between uh, women in college and men in college that has been growing for the last 25 years, but right now is about a 60% to 40% ratio of women to men. And 20 years ago, it was maybe a 5% differential, but in 20 years, it's grown to, to be a 20% differential women to men in college. Uh, there are probably, and there are many reasons for that, but a reason that, that links its way through is we're not doing collectively as a nation, uh, perhaps as good of a job as we can be, should be in how we're teaching boys in school. Um, and, and the research tells us of, of how boys learn best. They learn best by being active. They learn best by being tactile in their learning. Uh, they learn best when they can get out of their, their chair uh, to reinforce what they're learning while they're in their chair. Uh, they learn best in multi-dimensional, multi-dynamic type of situations. They learn best when they're they're learning with others. If you can throw some competition into that, they really learn best with that in terms of reinforcing the material. So all of the innovative aspects of our curriculum uh, lean into that in, in deliberate ways. Uh, the student-centered aspect of the school's culture has always worked well in, in teaching boys and really getting to know how, how each boy's mind works and, and where each boy's gifts and talents are. But when you throw some more activity and more project-based learning into their, into their overall learning experience and environment, it's, it, it's like a catalyst to, uh, to, to moving that learning uh, ahead at an at a exponentially higher level. Um, and, and that's the value of a boys' school where the teachers are used to teaching boys. And, and that energy that comes with teaching boys is, is directed in ways that promotes further learning. And if we're doing our job well, that energy is going to allow the boys to continue to explore areas that they have interest in. And the innovations that we've made in the curriculum are designed to do that, to be pathways where a boy can begin to discover other areas of interest. Maybe it's the beginnings of a passion and to create a pathway where you can uh, apply learning to that interest, to that passion. Uh, and, and that hopefully will, will lead them to even greater engagement in college. Um, and, and perhaps that's a good way for me to pivot to my colleague, Scott Harf, and, and, and ask him, you know, what are colleges looking for in students today, especially as we come through a pandemic when test scores, uh, particularly last year, weren't nearly as relevant as in the past? Yeah, uh, thank you, Bill. I, th I think it's, uh, it's interesting that we're talking on the on the high school side uh, and the college preparatory side of things. Uh, you know, the title of the webinar today is is talking about traditions um, 
and our uh, and how we're innovating. And colleges are are start, are doing the exact same thing. Uh, you know, Mr. Taylor referenced SATs, and then we've got the other traditional formula of how you get into college is your GPA, your grade point average. And certainly, are those important now? Yes, just like some of our traditions are important, but they're having to innovate. Um, you know, last year for the first time in essentially ever, every school out there was test optional. So there was no SAT, there was no ACT requirement. So there's this, I, I always look at it as this like missing data point that they had to figure out how a, a college application it, at the most basic level is a college looking at all these students that have applied and they're trying to pick out the ones that they think can do well at their institution. And traditionally, like I said, they looked at GPA, they looked at SAT. Now they're looking at three things. And it's, I was kind of laughing as uh, Mr. Taylor was saying these things, because we I promise we didn't talk about this before, but I have written down that we have community involvement, collaboration and communication as things that I'm hearing from colleges that they're looking for hey, we want our next step set of graduates. So these students that we're working with that five, six, seven, eight years from now are gonna graduate from their colleges. They want them to come in having already been involved in things. And you've heard uh, my colleagues talk about different clubs, sports have come up before. Um, we haven't talked about it yet, but I'm sure that uh, music, theater, Mr. Avis's fine arts, those are, those are gonna come up too. And, you know, in terms of community involvement, it's not necessarily just being involved in community service, but it's finding something that Mr. Taylor talked about passion. It's finding something that you're passionate about and can kind of identify yourself as. So certainly there, there are the athletes, but, you know, colleges also want to see kids who, while doing well in the classroom, they find something that they're really, really into, um, like maybe computer program or programming, or maybe it's the theater, um, or maybe it's the arts. So you're looking for that community involvement and what you're doing to fill your time that, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, you'd be preparing for the SAT or preparing for the ACT. Well, you might not be doing that anymore. So what are you, what are you filling your time with there? Uh, the other thing is collaborating. So collaborating with your peers, obviously, but also being able to collaborate with your teachers. And one thing we haven't talked about, but in my seven years at Kearney Pauling is um, is kind of in, in our blood is we all live here. And so teachers and students have the opportunity to collaborate almost 24 seven. And that's something that our graduates leave and they're used to and office hours are not this big, scary thing. They're used to talking to their teachers outside of school. Um, and then communication. So I, I look at this more um, traditionally in one sense that certainly written communication is a huge part of the college process. But also, uh, and we'll, Mr. Taylor talked about it a little bit, we'll get into the practicum for civic leadership, but a lot of that is also going to work on your public speaking skills so that you're able to communicate in more than one medium. And, and, and I'm sure, Scott, you would, you would say that colleges are not saying to you, you know, we, we're really not looking for anybody. We really don't care if they know how to write an essay. We really don't care if they haven't had any history or science. You know, it's just, it's the applied science. We don't care if they, if they took biology or chemistry. I mean, they are looking for that too. I mean, they're looking for both. Hey, absolutely. And, and the, the, the funny thing that I've noticed actually over the past several years is it used to be a very rigid, you know, you needed to take four English classes, but you only needed to take two social studies classes, or you only needed to take two science classes. And now what you're hearing is this very holistic approach where we want you to take advantage of your entire curriculum. And that's where, like you said, there, you know, that's a hint at, yeah, go through your regular English, English curriculum, go through your math curriculum as high as you can get. Same thing with science, same thing with social studies, take advantage of your arts curriculum. Um, but what it does is it, it, it's, it's asking the students to go take a risk and try something that might be outside of that very confined. And like I said, that rigid, um, that rigid curriculum that, that we all went through. And, and I think that's where our tradition, our innovation come together. Uh, you know, we, we still have a traditional college preparatory curriculum, 
but the innovations are both within it that we're not going to be you know focused on lecturing and all that we're going to draw the students and their energy out in the classroom but the innovations are also coming in how we're applying that learning and that knowledge to new and more creative ways and then we've dedicated the time to do both and and it's in though that that other time where they're learning how to synthesize material from physics and English, or they're synthesizing music and history uh, there. And that's where real creativity begins to, to be unleashed in, is in that synthesis process. So the, the practicum uh, emphasizes that in our winter projects, in our global collaborative challenge, where we randomly put uh, juniors in groups of five or six, and they have a, a real world problem that they have to solve and they have to present their solution uh, collaboratively and in a cogent uh, piece of, of verbal communication from including everybody of the group that's limited to 12 minutes and it's filmed. And, uh, and they learn how to communicate efficiently, but in a, in a creative and a collaborative way. And then, as I mentioned, the, the third component is a senior independent project that allows students to, to pursue their, their interests and perhaps uh, their passions. And, um, and then these institutes that we've just created are, are sort of the evolution of, of the, they connect to the practicum because uh, we've created four different areas where our students work in projects and, and specifically in their senior independent projects we're leading to projects uh, that reflected an interest in leadership, that reflected an interest in the environment, reflected an inter interest in being creative and innovative, and reflected an interest in citizenship. So we've created an institute for citizenship, an institute for leadership, an institute for entrepreneurialism, and an in institute for environmental stewardship. And we have faculty associated with each of those institutes. And on Saturdays uh, during the course of the year, one institute runs Saturday programming. It's an opportunity for all the students to get involved in learning that is active, that is engaged, that's around that theme. Uh, and and those, uh, those institutes will also begin to work to uh, be apparent into the more traditional uh, college preparatory curriculum as well. Uh, and so, Scott, as you've talked to college reps about both of these programs, both the practicum that we've done for six years and now the institute that we've just rolled out this year, what, what are you hearing from, from them about this type of innovation? They absolutely love them. And it's, it's been really fun this year because um, I haven't seen a lot of the college reps in person uh, just because of last year. They weren't able to be on campus. So there's a lot of uh, like we're doing now on Zoom. Uh, but everyone's slowly uh, venturing out again. And we have over 150 reps visiting campus this year. Most of them, like I said, are in person. And, um, you know, especially the people who might be new reps to our school, it's, it's really fun to get to explain exactly what we're talking about here with the practicum for civic leadership and the institutes because their eyes light, light up. Like I said, they're, they're, the colleges are stuck in this you know, traditionally we looked at SATs and GPAs and now we they have to, you know, the, like I said, there's that missing data point of most of them still are not looking at SATs and ACTs. So they need something else to latch onto to say, hey, this, this student here coming from Trinity Pauling, uh, how can we tell if they're going to be successful? And the answer for a lot of them is looking at what they're doing in the winter project, the GCC, um, and then hearing about what they're going to tackle in their SIP uh, starting at the end of next month. Um, you know, th there's collaboration, there's communication in there, there's a synthesis that Bill talked about. Um, and, and a lot of this is turning into not only is it piquing the interest of our college reps, but the students are really latching onto it and it becomes this really, really easy, but also very valuable essay topic that a lot of them are using um, or an interview topic. If they're going to do an interview whether it's with an alumnus of a school or with a with one of our reps, it becomes this, this very interesting conversation to talk to a 17, 18 year old kid who 
he might not have found his life passion, but he's found something he's certainly passionate about that's outside of, you know, it's outside of algebra and physics and it's outside of sports too. It, it, it heads in more often, it heads in more of a, you know, exploring kind of a career interest or exploring a, a hobby that's outside of something they ever thought they would have. Um, and then I think that the, the piece I really like is that the, the practicum and the institutes now are really coming together. And I look at it as, I think I talked about it last pride perspective we had that the, the four institute that, institutes that Bill mentioned are, they're, they're the pillars that the entire practicum is built around. So it's, it's slowly weaving its way into, um, you know, the students so that by the time they get to their senior independent project, they're taking this deep dive in something that colleges are looking for. Colleges are looking for entrepreneurial students. Colleges are looking for students who have an interest in environmental stewardship or citizenship or leadership. So, so it's all, it's allowing my office to be able to tell these wonderful stories of students coming out that are entirely prepared for college. Gabe, Josh, and, and Ralph, uh, fr from the classroom teacher's perspective, uh, both sort of teaching traditionally in the classroom, but then what we're doing outside of the classroom, what has been your experience uh, with both the tradition and the innovation coming together? Sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, so, um, me personally, I, I've been able to work with um, the Global Collaborative Challenge as well as uh, the Winter Projects, and um, that part that that's really interesting is uh, faculty members getting to um, share some passions with the students. Whether uh, you know, last year I did a uh, fly tying uh, winter project. And uh, at first, uh, my colleague and I were, were nervous because we had to do it over Zoom. We're, we weren't sure, sure if they were going to show up. And um, they all showed up. And, and we, would liter we literally you know, tied flies together for two hours. Um, and it, it was great. And then uh, getting to do you know, the global collaborative and, and seeing kids kind of you know, struggle at first in terms of trying to come together. Um, but then, you know, putting together this presentation and, and, you know, uh, assigning roles and, and, um, really diving deep into some problems that, you know, haven't been solved by, uh, adults. Um, and, and so it's great to kind of see them working on, on things that are applicable to, uh, our, our general studies, um, but applying it to issues that are going on around the world um, and getting to kind of assist them, um, but also kind of be a part of it with them is, it, it's a unique thing uh, happening, learning that's happening outside of the uh, normal classroom. So that, that's been uh, a lot of fun. I would say uh, previously uh, with the farm, I had a student who participated, I'm gonna talk later about the farm itself, but this was prior to the creation of the institutes. I had a student who uh, participated in farming with me and then later did his senior independent project on composting. Uh, and sort of there was a connection there. And, and I see the same thing happening now. This is obviously the first year we've had the institutes, but I can already tell that you know, the seniors, especially I'm, in the, I'm involved in the uh, Environmental Institute, and the seniors who participated with us uh, will be very likely that their senior independent projects have been you know, sort of spawned out of their experiences this fall in, in our Environmental Institute Saturday uh, and what we did there. So I also, and sort of having the institutes uh, uh, in place formally helps, uh, I guess, you know, in, in my span, I teach Spanish, in my Spanish class, instead of just teaching sort of Spanish or uh, history of the Dominican Republic, maybe now the conversation can change and, and not only are we going to look at the history of the DR, uh, but we can also, I can say, hey, environmental guys, let's look at what's happening currently with deforestation in the mountains of DR and, and what's the impact of that. And, hey, and, you know, and entrepreneurship, guys, why is it that people are cutting down trees? They know they need them. What's, what's, so what's the cause behind that? And, and sort of there's, you know, I've got kids that have participated in these in the institutes 
and they have that sort of experience and knowledge and that comes into the classroom and and also so, so you know that then enriches our uh, our experience in the classroom in, engaging with material that i would have done otherwise but now in a new way so that i appreciate that yeah i'll i'll just add just jotting down some things that have been said here just for me personally, as a new faculty member, you know, traditions root us, they root teachers in our practice, they root institutions in their in their mission. But as educators, we also have an obligation to be innovative, we have to be innovative for our students, we have to be innovative for um, our peers, we have to be innovative all around. And I think what the past, you know, year and a half plus has taught us is um, you know, project-based learning continues to be um, a strong part of our of our curriculum. Scaffolding our classes to what Jeff Beck was saying earlier, keeping it student-centered. Uh, Scaffolding our classes to continue to be student-centered is is another innovation and, and also a tradition that we have. Differentiated learning and teaching is um, at the forefront um, of, of of classes and, of course, um, active learning. So. Um, it, you know, I, I'll approach it as a, as a new faculty member in the midst of COVID that um, traditions are great. They, they root us in, in where we are, but um, innovation is just as important. Great, wonderful, thank you. And, and I, I wanna make sure that we are not forgetting Roberta on this call here. Um, so I wanna toss a question over to Roberta here um, oh, about, <laughs> about <laughs> making sure you're not falling asleep over there. Uh, we no, have a no. question about the Center for Learning Achievement that came through uh, and you as the Dean of Teaching and Learning, uh, can you please address kind of how the Center for Learning Achieve Achievement fits into the curriculum? And if you wanna to touch on anything innovative and or traditional from that program that we have uh, here at Trinity Pauling. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, you know, the, the Center for Learning Achievement will always have a soft uh, place in my heart. It's uh, where I grew into what I'm doing now. And um, it directly impacts about 20% of our student populations through courses, through our courses in our signature programs, which is our LEAD program, our EMP program, English Mastery program, and our Executive Skills program. And um, the faculty of the, the Center for Learning Achievement are, are passionate and extremely empathetic to a fault sometimes. Um, but their role it, it extends beyond the CLA to include faculty co collaboration. Um, it's, it's amazing to watch um, all of our teachers rally around a student, whether they're a part of the Center for Learning Achievement or um, just a student that um, ha is, uh, has a different learning style or needs differentiated instruction. Um, but all students benefit from our student-centered our student -centered approach to learning and our teaching practices. And they also benefit from differentiated instruction. Today's students require a different way to engage them. So I think of what Bill always we used to talk about the the the, the torture desks, right? In lines. And the you know, the reason why that structure of the classroom used to be um, was was basically classroom management. And it was the structure of it was it was teacher-centered, right? They were up in the front and the students were, you know, sit, be quiet. And that doesn't, that kind of engagement doesn't work with today's population. I think we're at a crossroads where, you know, uh, predictable structures like that um, require a different methodology. And that requires our teachers to stretch and get a little uncomfortable, right? And, um, you know, a student-centered approach requires cognitive flexibility and humility from teachers. We have to, we have to have thoughtful reflection when when we get in that classroom and something isn't working for a kid, we got to get scrappy and and be willing to will have a willingness to learn from them um, to take the role on as a student of this um, environment for them. And I think that that that's the beauty of what's going on in our school right now is watching us learn and evolve and innovate and be creative um, because the students are our priority and um, and you see that passion generated from our faculty and the students feel it and you'll see it when they go and they they reach out to a student or a, another faculty member for help on something that they have no context about um, 
you know, the, that relationship that is built because their willingness to be vulnerable and to be authentic um, with our faculty. Um, that's the big thing about uh, our faculty and, and how we approach student-centered student education. You know, it's interesting, the Center for Learning Achievement, if you trace its history back to its origins in the early 1970s, when it had a different title, it was innovative. It, it was entrepreneurial. It was, it, it was created by, by two teachers um, who, you know, Ted and Carol Nealon, but Ted Nealon teaching English, realizing he was not able to to reach some of his students and and the more he he dug in and his wife carol who had a background in learning differences discovered that some of the students in the class had had not been diagnosed with a learning difference yeah. and and so they created a curriculum that would that would allow them to shine and and by by allowing the compensatory strategies that they had developed to be channeled with energy towards ways that they would have a better uh, a better understanding of, of processing language and, and coding and decoding language. Uh, and so it was innovative at the beginning, which you know is fascinating. Absolutely. And we continue that with with trying to fill that, figure out what the child's toolbox is, trying to figure out what works best for them. And that requires trial and error. And uh, you know. I am a true believer in making sure that we, we teach writing and teach those traditional aspects, but we need to, to teach those skills to be able to shift and adapt to, to the needs of you know, today's world. So uh, yeah, they were before their time and, uh, uh, you know, it, and it's not always easy to, to develop a curriculum that um, sometimes is remedial and component in its, in its um, design and making sure that it's pretty innovative for and, and exciting and creative for an adolescent boy, so. For sure, for sure. I'd like to continue with uh, keeping Roberta and actually Scott for this question here about what new traditions have emerged during the pandemic. If you wanna to touch on that briefly as, as we're gonna pivot from there and kind of go into um, kind of the innovative side, innovation side um, after we, we get into that. But I'd love to kind of hear from you all on uh, what any, any new traditions, which kind of is an oxymoron um, at, at the core of it, but I would love to hear from you all about that. Well, I could, I have a perfect example today um, when we have to really shift when a, a, a student can't be here or a teacher can't be here for some odd reason, um, our, our ability is to do adapt with technology. Um, uh, the communication network that's been built because of COVID, uh, those things have inspired us to think of, think of, uh, think out of the box really in the way we approach problem solving. Um, we, I think are really reflective uh, in the way that, you know, we, we'd like to unpack when things are, our, our, our last year's winter session was really hard because it was all, uh, it was all remote. And that's really hard to engage people that really need hands-on um, activities through a screen. And we learned a lot. We were we were successful, extremely successful. Now we're really excited to take that piece and build upon it in this winter session now um, to expand, to use our beautiful campus, to um, dream a little bigger, uh, uh, travel a little farther, and get a little more excited with with what potentially we can come up with for um, our projects, and making sure that we're hitting those skill sets, um, understanding that that. Um, this isn't a substitution for academics, but it's an enhancement. So. For sure. And Scott, I guess if you want to touch on, you know, the other piece of that question is, and again, it being student centered, uh, how have the students responded to some of those more innovative approaches to learning? Yeah, yeah, the kids have, the kids have honestly loved, loved it. I mean, I'm speaking for them as a group here, but the, the I think just an example of, of some of the projects that they've really um bought into and some of them they've really led is we'll, we'll start with we'll go through all three of them but some of the highlights i've jotted down for the winter project i think this was a mr frost idea uh but there's a pizza oven down by the 
down by the pond that was just used for some advisee dinners last week. So it's fully functional. Um, and there was uh, three or four years ago, Mr. Frost and his um, team for the winter project, they did everything from, um, I believe, getting the lumber uh, to building that pizza oven. So maybe he can uh, touch on that a little bit later. Um, I think Mr. Frioli might have been involved in this one, but there was a fly tying winter project uh, for fly fishing. There's been several fly fishing ones. Um, throughout the years. Uh, last year, uh, Mr. Gilman and Mr. Doyle uh, did a like, rift off of the movie Moneyball. So they did kind of a statistics and sports. So those are some of the more successful winter projects and very engaging winter projects for the boys. Global Collaborative Challenge, I think we already talked about, um, might have already touched on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That's always a classic question that the kids tackle. I think the GCC, I always kind of chuckle because it's, it's the questions that like the smartest adults in the world can't figure out. We ask a bunch of 17 year olds to figure it out in two and a half weeks and give a 12 minute presentation on it. So it, they come up with some incredible answers to these difficult questions. Some of the other ones where we've asked them to, to come up with a plan for a zero waste dining hall on a college or a boarding school campus. Uh, Mr. Fridelli's one last year that I loved was should dams be removed from the Pacific rivers in the Pacific Northwest. So Again, they're these, they're these enormous, hence the like global collaborative challenge. They're, they're collaborative, but they're also global in nature. But they're these questions that, that they can't be answered in 12 minutes, but the kids do, they dive right in. And it's funny to watch them. You know, we had one on the electoral college a few years ago, and all of a sudden we've got these like five electoral college scholars walking around campus, talking everyone's ear about, off about um, what they learned and what their new views on it are. Um, and then just to touch on some of the, the senior independent projects that I've been lucky to have been involved in. Um, we had a student last year who built an app that's actually going through a full-on funding process right now. Uh, it's called Eyewitness, and it, it's an app you can put on your phone and it records your interactions if you feel as though you're in a compromising situation. Um, we had another student last year who he took this interest in, in welding, which feels very career-based um, and he was not someone who I would say ever felt overly artistic um, and he welded these incredible decorative gates um, and some sculptures. I think Mrs. Lito might have one of his sculptures um, at her house, but that was a, another one where, where it, it was incredible to be involved in. Um, we've had students who design and construct their own longboard. Uh, another great one from a few years ago, a student who wrote and produced uh, and directed their own musical full of a student cast, completely on their own. Uh, and this is a kid who in his chapel talk, his senior year talked about how he came here, he thought it was just a lacrosse player. And he left being so much more than just a lacrosse player. Um, we've had students do their own films, biopics. Um, so the, the kids are really buying into it. And the fun thing for me getting to work with the seniors is we're at the point now where all these seniors have seen, you know, Mr. Fidelis talked about the Proctors on dorm. They've seen from the moment they were freshmen on dorm, their seniors, their, that they, uh, their role models on campus go through this process. So they're coming to me talking about this senior independent project that they've been dying to do for the last three or four years. And that to me speaks, speaks very highly to how involved and engaged the kids are in this, this pursuit here. Wonderful, thank you, Josh or Ralph. Do you want to add anything to that um, specifically? Either about uh, the entrepreneurial or Gabe, rather that two entrepreneurial side of things. Josh, I know you're you're heavily involved with the Environmental Institute, um, but anything else you want to add to to, uh, to to that kind of that question about how the students have taken to this this approach? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd take the opportunity to talk about the farming as well. Um, and just, I don't think we touched on this in our last webinar about the Environmental Institute, uh, but sort of a, a huge piece of that is, is the farm that we have on campus. And uh, I was doing some calculations and, and I think we've got about 2,500 square feet of, of covered greenhouse growing space and a one acre garden. And that's substantial. And we've sort of been gearing up and, and the students have been preparing the gardens to really produce fruits and vegetables. And uh, sort of we've enjoying the, the evolution of that and, and seeing it grow. And this year, for the first time, they've grown uh, vegetables that we're now eating in our dining hall. 
up in the garden. And we actually, a few weeks ago, we, it's great to teach kids how to grow food and what goes into that. And sort of that, that sort of grows along with the environmental, environmental Institute. The goal is to get kids uh, to increase their awareness of, of the natural world, but also their appreciation of it. Because I would say it's a lot easier to, to, uh, for people to want to protect something. It's the, you know, it's in, the, the Institute is, in, the, uh, is for environmental stewardship. So if we're trying to teach kids how to take, or why to take care of, uh, of the resources of the natural world, you have to start by helping them become passionate about what there is and just discovering what's there. So the Envi Environmental Institute does that. The farming does that as well. Um, and so a few weeks ago, we, you know, we took produce from the garden and we had the boys over to our house and we helped them prepare a meal. You know, it was, it was pretty, a pretty basic meal, admittedly. It was salsa. Uh, but they, yeah, but they had never done this before. They had never cut up a tomato. They had never done these things. So, I mean, having them, you know, the next evolution I see is, you know, can we not only teach kids how to grow this stuff, but also learn how to cook it and eat it for, you know, for their long-term health. And also the next piece is, can we start donating this produce and having the boys, you know, have that link to community service? Can we start preparing meals with you know, food that they've grown uh, for the community, for those in need? So that sort of lots happening there um, but there's a there's a there's a ton of carryover into the classroom for me and I, I can tell you just anecdotally as a student that's doing farming now who uh, I've seen grow exponentially this year in all it, socially and academically he's doing so much better and and for the last few weeks I've noticed he's just been coming up to the farm beating beating me up there for our practice and just sitting under a cedar tree on a bench. And you know, I thought maybe he'd have AirPods in or something and or be consuming some sort of media, but he wasn't. He's just been sitting there and just you know, being outside and decompressing. And it's really been helping him. And so, I mean, the benefits are so multifaceted with getting just simply getting kids outside. I, I love that we have the opportunity to do that, not only in the Environmental Institute, but also with the farm. So long-winded, sorry, but uh, there's just a lot happening there. No, I think it speaks to your passion for sure. <laughs> uh, thank you. So I, I'm going to uh, push push ahead here um, and, and kind of ask uh, Headmaster uh, Taylor again. Um, you know, it, it, how do you feel or how do you think we can work as a school to keep uh, traditions, uh, you know, discipline based uh, within that instruction, but also part of that full ex school experience, right? Because not everything we do is is in the classroom, and not everything our students learn and leave our campus with are, are from the classroom. So, how can we kind of find find that line between innovation and discipline, not just in the classroom but beyond as well? I, you know, I think it's uh, it's a discovery process. Um, because what you know, what's in the balance is time, and and time is the most precious of all commodities in schools, uh, and and particularly in boarding schools. But boarding schools are blessed with more time. But the advantage of boarding school, even if you're a day student, is that you have more time to dive into into these opportunities for learning. So if we want to continue to emphasize the role that traditions play in a traditional college preparatory environment, but also be innovative, we, we need to do it through the fulcrum of time and, and how we can be flexible with time, how we can uh, be creative with time. But the, the lens through which we study that has to be through the student experience and how we are best preparing the boys for college and life beyond college, because it is about them. And, and so some of the things that we are doing to be innovative force us as educators to be innovative and getting us out of our comfort zone because it's better for the boys and their learning. And so part of that time is, is for us to sort of say, okay, how can we grow professionally? How can we become uh, adaptive and how we value time, knowing that the, the, the end result has to be for the, the, uh, the benefit of the boys and their learning. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I really appreciate uh, 
hearing all of this. And I, I think that oftentimes boarding schools and, and a place like Trinity Pauling can, can forget that we already are on the cutting edge of a lot of uh, academic and innovative pro, you know, pieces of education uh, just by our small class sizes. And the, and the fact that uh, it was said earlier that our teachers live on campus, 90% of our teachers live on campus and, and our, our students have access to them. That is already innovative and, and, and pushing the envelope in terms of academics. Uh, so when we, when we talk about some of these traditional things, in many cases for our new students, it is actually an innovative thing for those students to understand the, the relationship that they're able to build with our, uh, with our faculty. So that's really important. I'd, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our panelists tonight. Uh, and, and thank you, Scott, Gabe, Roberta, Josh, and, and Ralph, and especially to uh, Headmaster Taylor. Thank you all so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, we will have a, uh, an open house, actually a Trinity Pauling experience this weekend. Uh, so if you are interested in being on campus to experience a little bit more uh, hands-on and hear, hear more about all the uh, traditional and innovative uh, things on campus, please uh, feel free to sign up online. We'd love to have you. Uh, we will also have a fireside chat next Monday uh, that will be a little bit more of an interactive uh, Zoom as opposed to a webinar. And then we will follow up with our uh, fourth installment of uh, the Pride Perspectives on uh, November 10th. Uh, so that'll be the last one before that Thanksgiving break. But again, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, we hope to uh, hope that we we've been able to answer your questions. And if you have any others, please don't hesitate to reach out. But thank you all again and have a great evening. Thank you.